Welcome to the Seeding Social Good podcast by Turnkey. I'm Katrina Van Hus, chair and founder of Turnkey, and this podcast is all about figuring out what works to help us all do more good faster. This episode is, in a word, robust. Post-COVID, human behavior changed significantly when it comes to philanthropy and support for nonprofits. In-person events continue to struggle. It's harder and harder for nonprofits to find new donors. And overall, individual giving has declined for several years in a row. This panel will dive into how the fundraising landscape has shifted, and more importantly, how nonprofits are responding and what might be better ways to respond. What will it really take to stop the downward trends? Let's talk about it with big thinkers. Maria Clark with Good United brought this panel together and will introduce us all. It's a good one. Let's go. Started and just want to welcome everyone for joining today's conversation about the decline of the small donor and what you can do about it. Our panel is going to dive into how the fundraising landscape has shifted and more importantly, uh, how are you as a nonprofit leader responding and what is your organization going to do about it? I'm honored to make the introductions today for our panel. I'll start with myself. I am Maria Clark. I'm the EVP of Partnerships and Chief Evangelist at Good United. And I'll introduce our panel. We're going to start with our moderator, Katrina Van Hus from Turnkey. If you have been in the nonprofit industry for more than five minutes, you probably know Katrina. Next, we have Nathan Chapel. Nathan, thank you for joining. He's a co-author of The Generosity Crisis, and he's the co-founder of Fundraising AI, a company that supports nonprofits. And then we have Jill Davis. Jill and I have had the pleasure of working together for a couple of years, and she is the new chief growth officer at PANCAN, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. So you're really going to give us that perspective of what nonprofits are facing. And then last but not least, Dr. Otis Fulton. He is a social psychologist by trade, and what he's going to bring to the table is just a deeper understanding of human behavior, all that deep psychology stuff. All right, so let's set the stage here. Um, From the Giving USA report, giving by individuals has declined 6.4% in 2022, unless you adjust for inflation, at which point it is a decline of 13.4%. Nathan was weighing in earlier saying like, you know, is that just coming off the COVID bump that we're seeing such a decline? And the answer is, Nathan, no, no. Yeah. So go ahead. No, yeah, no. Well, and we can talk more about it, but this is uh, something that's been a long time coming and and COVID actually gave us a different glimmer of hope that there'd be a reversal of that trend, but um, has not proven to be the case. Yep. And further, mega gifts by individuals totaled 14 billion in 2022 and represented about 5% of all giving by individuals for a second year in a row. So what that means is all in, fewer people give, but a very few give at a high amount, which artificially inflates our averages. So the numbers could be worse. Um, In 2022, individual giving as a percentage of disposable income reached its lowest level since 1995, at 1.7% of total personal income. So I'm going to do my best to keep this panel first in the why is this happening space, and then we're going to move to the what to do about it space. But I will tell you that I am victimized by bright, shiny questions in the chat. So bring it, people. All right. So um, we know that this is a, a storm of different things causing this, but I'm going to ask each panelist first, what do you think the leading reason is for the decline of the small donor dollar? And Jill, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Great. Thanks, Katrina. Um, So in the conversations I've been having with friends and colleagues doing a variety of nonprofit work, I do hear one big theme, although it's a theme that has a lot of click downs. Levels of giving by the small dollar donors are often a proxy for enthusiasm and or issue urgency. And I think, as we all know, in the last several years, our communities have faced just numerous issues that have needed our urgent attention, our action, our funds. And when you pair that with generational differences in giving, a perception, whether true or not, that the ultra rich can afford to give more and the decline of the middle class, we're in the perfect fundraising storm. And then Frankly, not to throw a wrench in the conversation too early, but I couldn't help but think as I was preparing my thoughts for today, 
and we're talking amongst friends, but even the use of the word small dollar donor, even if we're just using it internally in our organization, it makes me wonder if we're minimizing their very real impact, how we prioritize resources, how we galvanize team members to get creative with us. If you call a colleague and say, I have a major donor on the hook, I bet they call you right back. But when you say, I want to get creative on my small dollar donor strategy, you might go lower on their priority list. So I just wonder if even internally, we're not doing ourselves a little bit of a disservice by how we talk about these donors and our strategies. So not to throw a wrench in the title before we even get further in there. <laughs> I, know. I know Katrina can take it. <laughs> I'm going to follow you down that path. Uh, Natalie Carlisle in our last book had the best quote ever in that she um, talked about how major donors didn't start out as major donors. And even though they bring no associated cost into that revenue channel, they started somewhere else. They started out probably as a small dollar donor. So I applaud your sentiment there. Otis, I want you to answer the primary question, which is what do you think the leading cause is? But before you do that, can you comment on what Jill said about how does that make me feel? If I'm donating my hundred bucks and Mackenzie Scott just landed 25 million, how does that make me feel? Well, it, it's it's all about how it makes you feel, and you know, um, uh, I think Jill really did uh, hit hit on something that that's crucially important and something that I think about all the time, and you know, and that's uh, that's income inequality. I I'm not trying to make a political statement. This is just purely from a psychological standpoint. Income inequality is a cancer that has been eating away at our society, and I think that 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 what we're seeing in terms of the nonprofit sector. Uh, being down uh, with uh, the number of donations, people who donate and so forth, is is really just a symptom of this. It's it's interesting. Dr. Keith Payne at the University of North Carolina wrote a book, uh, seminal book in this called The uh, Broken Ladder some years ago. And, um, you know, what he talks about is that, you know, how how wealthy one feels isn't a, a matter of the actual money that you have. It's, it's uh, people's sense of where they are and stand in relation to other people. And um, so, you know, it, it's that feeling poor that matters. It, it doesn't have anything to do with with objectively being, uh, being poor. And, you know, I, I say it's a cancer in our society because, you know, it's been shown, uh, research has shown that inequality, um, you know, it, it it has all of the, at least all of the social maladies we, we associate with poverty, things like, um, you know, lower than life, uh, average life expectancies, health problems, uh, mental illness and crime. So, you know, from where I sit, I, 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 I see this as just one uh, of the other symptoms of income inequality. And, you know, a, a fascinating, very easy to do little study would be to track um, the number of homes who donate and the amount of income inequality that you see in the United States. And, and I bet it would be an inverse line, hmm. inverse relationship. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you the primary question. What do you think is the biggest reason that um, the small dollar donor is in decline? Is that me? Yeah. I'm sorry. Otis. sorry, I'm making <laughs> eye contact. You can't. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 it, it's that people feel less wealthy, and and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I I think that there's some uh, some um, uh, some things having to do with social norms. You know, we 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 hear about these large dollar donors. Um, you know, uh, Seth Godin has you've heard me use this quote many times. People people like us do things like this. You know, we don't think about Bill Gates as being people like us. So we don't think about donating, you know, when, when he donates a lot of money and so forth. You know, that's not establishing any kind of a social norm for us. So, you know, what we need to see is people like us uh, making donations like this. So those are the kinds of things that that I think that nonprofits need to to really promote more is, you know, here's, here's this person just like you. And, uh, you know, maybe he didn't make the most money in, in his life, but he he left a legacy gift. Yeah, he left a gift of a will to the American Cancer Society or whoever it was. You know, those are the kind of social norms that we really need to promote amongst our donor pool uh, to get them feeling like people like us do things like this. All right, very good. I'm going to go to Nathan now. Nathan, primary question is, what is the biggest reason? Your book enumerates many reasons, and I hope we'll get to yeah. a lot of them. What's the biggie? <laughs> you know, it, that, it, it's such a hard question for me to answer, right? Because I want to answer, you know, that it's it's a confluence of a lot of different things. Things that Jill and Otis just highlighted are obviously significant. But to be honest, like it, reflecting on this, 
you know, when I wrote the book and we were, we worked on it for a number of years, I've been studying the decline in generosity since 2012 in the evolution of mega gifts and essentially how that was kind of taken away. I, I, if I think back how I would have answered the question in the past, I would have said originally it's, it's this crowding out effect and, you know, it's just people don't feel that their gifts are significant anymore. Um, after I wrote the book, um, or right when the book was released, I probably would have said, well, it's really a change in societal expectations and the attention economy and how essentially our attention is being pulled in so many different directions and we can peel back that onion later. But something that surprised me after the book was released and my co-author Brian and Crimson and I, we've had the opportunity to travel the country. I mean, for a while we were traveling every week. We spoke with probably 10,000 people and the theme that emerged for me, which became even kind of transcended past the the confluence of other things like the decline in religion and government affiliation and uh, um, that type of thing was was that the way that nonprofits, it became very clear to me that the way that nonprofits are evaluated is what has created this issue. And no matter the way we slice it, if essentially a CDO um, in America today wants to keep their job, they essentially are measured by how well they fill the bucket or how quickly they fill the bucket or how much they overflow the bucket. Not very seldom, very seldom, probably not ever, how many relationships did you bring along? How many net new relationships did you have last year versus this year? And so it's something we don't even really address in the book, but it came over and over and over again that if boards don't understand, so the answer to my question would be, the biggest issue is that I think the metric of success incentivizes um, a type of fundraising that prioritizes wealth. And that goes back to income equality and actually goes to what Jill's uh, point of like focusing on major givers, you know, versus smaller donors. If the metric of success is largely based on wealth and we're then prioritizing, incentivizing, raise more money from wealthy people, the rest of those things all kind of fall suit, you know. I mean, at, at the point, I think we've kind of created our own, our bed. Like we made our bed in this this way of doing this for so many years of equating philanthropy with wealth. And the thing is, like everyone in our industry already knows that philanthropy has nothing to do with wealth at its core. You know, the the paradox of generosity is the more you give, the better you feel, and it brings up that inherent question of are people inherently, you know, generous or or not. I think most people that we've talked to would say, yeah, there's this this nature that people want to give. They just aren't incentivized or prioritized in a way to to want to do that over and over again. So I guess to distill that all down, I think I think our country and 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 largely UK, Canada, and many others need to reevaluate the definition of what it means to be successful in a fundraising role. Okay. Before I go to Maria, I want to go back to Otis. And Otis, what I think I just heard Nathan say is that people on the receiving end of our solicitations are not satisfied. Is that what I'm hearing, Nathan? Like they, we are not creating relationships with them and for them that are satisfying enough to remain engaged. Yeah, I would say that it would be the result of um, of metrics and KPIs that incentivize a smaller you know, more wealthier group of people. So therefore, because that attention is spent on those individuals, we're essentially forgetting a majority of the pipeline um, and not creating those, you know, unique experiences. Okay. So um, Otis, what is it that would keep an individual, a constituent with us over time? What are the things that would make them remain with us? Well, you know, um, there's a, as you know, there's a lot of psychology on this, you know, what makes people satisfied in any aspect of their life. And, and, you know, the, there, there, are, there are three things that, that, that people report in satisfying relationships. They, they have a sense of uh, relatedness. They feel connected to something bigger than themselves. Um, they have a sense of autonomy that what they're doing is something that they want to do and they have some freedom to however, however they do this thing. And then the third thing is competence. It means that you know, they feel like they're doing something that's important and they have an opportunity to get back to, to, to get better at it. And, you know, so I, 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 I've often said that organizations can kind of do a little self-diagnostic by thinking, well, you know, do I provide my my uh, people who are my donors with, with these three things to a sense of autonomy, you know? Um, uh, a sense of competence that they're able to do something important and get better, you know, a sense of, re of relatedness. 
um, before we came on, Nathan was was talking about how during COVID there were a lot of uh, there were organizations who who got uh, uh, kind of a uh, uh, the a lot of donations that they didn't even thank people for. I mean, yeah. you know that that that's kind of the fundamental blocking and tackling. How kind of what kind of a relationship can you have with with someone when you don't even thank them for making a donation? So, uh, so anyway, I, I'm did that answer your question, Katrina? It did. Thank you. Well done, you. Now, Maria, you are loaded for bear with examples both from your current life and your past life about what Otis just talked about about giving people a satisfying experience. Yeah. Um, you've experienced in your uh, prior life in your decades of work with the national nonprofit giving high satisfaction or creating a situation that gave high satisfaction and created people who were warriors in terms of their affinity to the mission and the longevity of their involvement. And now you've moved to a new situation where you're sort of doing that again. So um, number one, answer the question. And then number two, if you could connect what Otis and Nathan were saying to your experience. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, When I was thinking about and this question, I kind of took a more practical like, cause that's the way I like, how do I solve this? So I was looking at it from a different angle. So you're right. In my previous role working at a nonprofit, I thought it was all about um, the growing competition and how can we elevate our brand? So it is more compelling than the other brand. So there must be something in the way we're messaging or sharing our impact that we could do better at. Or how can we find more people out there that have an affinity to our cause? So thinking about like existing segments that may already be connecting to our organization and how can we do a better, more efficient job of bringing them into the organization? So that was kind of where a lot of what the work that we did in my previous role was how can we do a better job of telling our story and compelling people to engage and getting those one, you know, those uh, smaller donors at a high volume to support us because they they know us and they care about us. So that was my focus then. Having worked for a technology company now for a couple of years, I really shifted my thinking. And I think it's about the change in human behavior, the way people engage, where they spend their time, how they want to make transactions. Uh, I think it's really uh, important for nonprofits to think about, have we changed our, uh, the way that we, as Jill said, the way that we thank them or the way that we ask them to engage, does it match the way they are living the rest of their lives? Um, I think there's a big disconnect that we are thinking instead about how can we get our new small donors or existing small donors back into our systems as opposed to how can we create a new way to talk to them, to engage them, to invite them, to give them a call to action. So really looking at what are the trends in human behavior? And the example there is Amazon. I can buy dog food with two clicks. I think all shopping should be that way. So why wouldn't we expect all donations to be that way too, for some people? Um, and if you look at it, social media is good or bad. It's where people are spending their time. So are we creating those genuine connections, opportunities for thank yous and two-way conversation, like Otis said, that really fulfills people? Are we creating those in the places where people are spending their time? They're on their phone, they're on social media. And so, you know, you really got to do an audit of what are we doing currently? Is it really matching or evolving with the way human behavior has changed? Love it. Jill, yeah. you've uh, been able to listen to these three. What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I feel like there's, several threads that I'll, I'm going to try to pull together here, but I couldn't agree more with what Maria Otis and Nathan have said. I think investing in strategies that meet donors where they are is huge. And we expect people to come to where we are and nobody in the for-profit world expects their customers to come to them. They go to them. So I, I Maria couldn't agree more that this is about meeting people where they are. I, I do also think when we think about issue awareness, that is different to me than brand awareness. Because I agree with you, Maria, too. There's a lot of like, well, if I make my brand cooler, people will want to come work yeah. with me, yeah. which is different than do you understand the power of you, donor, working on this mission with purpose that we both care about? Because I think that gives to the relatedness and the connectivity piece that Otis and Nathan have talked about. And, and what I've come to really value over specifically really the last few years is I think 
as fundraisers, it is both our responsibility and our opportunity to galvanize community for something greater than our mission. It's about our purpose. And that's where I think that human connectedness comes to. But if you're really going to galvanize community, what's that emotional connection? How are we being a, taking a strategic shift in how we solicit funds, which could be anything like fundraising integration? ease of giving, simple and urgent messaging. But I also continue to come back to um, a quote I've heard Danny Meyer say a million times, who was a board member at a previous organization and the founder of Union Square Hospitality Group of business like life is all about how you make people feel. And yeah. we want people to feel the way we feel at the organization versus the organization leaning a little bit more in to how the person feels. And it's got to be that two-way exchange. Yeah. You don't have to follow me and I don't have to follow you, but we have to be on the same path together. And I think that's the shakeup that tr a little bit of traditional fundraising is a little bit resistant to right now. Well, and uh, Katrina, you had asked how this, you know, the philosophy of this two-way communication, how that's evolved. And I think COVID, unfortunately, and I hate to even bring up COVID because I'm so over it, but it took the power of uh, that interpersonal connection from events. It removed that for a good 18 months. And so I think the practical side of what Jill's expressing is that how do we um, provide validation, have that, uh, you know, show the impact. It has to be, there has to be a communication vehicle. And when you can no longer be in person in communities, because we just don't have the resources anymore for a lot of nonprofits and events are still working to come back. But are you, really proactively addressing how can we establish that two-way communication following human behavior, the change in human behavior. Email was great. Direct mail was great. It still is powerful, but is that the way people truly want to communicate? And if that's answer is no, what are you going to do to build a communications channel yeah. that can give you that two-way? You're not just pushing at them, but you're getting response back. So Otis, I want to come to you and I want to ask you about what kind of communication is most satisfying to us as humans? Um, what is the environment in which we are happiest getting it? Yeah, you know, I, I think that a good community fulfills a person's need for belonging. And belonging is a tremendous drive that that people have. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a very depressing book called The Chaos Machine, and it talks it's a it's a very well-sourced history of social media and it talks about how social media has co-opted the the all the beautiful theory that social psychologists like me study to do one thing just to keep people uh on facebook or whatever these platforms are for as long as possible so they can sell them the most ads but you know the they really hit on it because they what what a good community does is it provides people with what is called a social validation feedback loop okay so i'm going to join i'm a big animal rights advocate as katrina knows um i i actually donate to save a turkey's life while we eat turkey at thanksgiving so there's a paradox there i understand <laughs> but um uh, so i i may be uh so i'm going to be drawn to communicate with people who are like me because they validate this belief system that i have these attitudes these values and as i engage with them, it strengthens that part of my identity, which makes me even more likely to come back and engage with them more. So it's this feedback loop that keeps going round and around. And as I said, it can be used for good or it can be used for, for evil, <laughs> not to be too, yeah. too, too, too melodramatic, but I really feel that way. And so, you know, creating these opportunities for people to get this social validation in these communities is just, just really cr uh, critical to structure um, structure the communications that way. Nathan, in your book, you talked about a belonging crisis. Uh, can you talk about that and connect it to this conversation? Yeah, I think it, you know, riffing off what Otis was saying, I mean, that, you know, the, the power of connection was once essentially how, you know, nonprofits in America, you know, were essentially the glue of civil society. You know, when Alexis de Tocqueville came here and wrote about, this amazing sense of community that we had that he hadn't seen any other country that he traveled, I think it was pretty profound, you know, and, and to be clear, you know, 
what we're we're talking about is charitable participation, not generosity. So just to be clear, like you know that that idea of needing and feeling like we need to connect as humans is not really um, it's still there. I think it manifests itself in different ways now. and and you know when we look at and generationally too, and, and we can talk about this more later, if we look at, you know, the decline in, in giving. So 18% over the last 20 years, a decline in the number of people that give. So less than 49% of Americans now give. That was, you know, more than two thirds of American 20 years ago. Like, I mean, we're, we're pretty significant, but it also doesn't mean that people aren't, are less generous. What it means is that people aren't finding nonprofits as that specific and only pathway to creating community. So if we look at GoFundMe, GoFundMe processes one transaction per second, 24 seven. People want to feel that they're making an impact. They wanna do it with the least amount of friction, um, kind of riffing off Maria's point. They want to be a part of a community um, and inherently want, want to help. So I think that essence of still wanting to belong is there. And what has happened is that the nonprofit, instead of being an amplifier of a person's generosity has now become a barrier of it. Meaning that if I if I give and I'm not thanked, or if I give and I'm loosely thanked, and or I'm not made to feel like this is something that organization you know didn't value my my small gift versus you know um, Mackenzie Scott's gifts. So I think it's all an opportunity. I actually I think that I, I believe that people still even more now than ever probably have this inherent sense of belonging that people want to feel connected to something. And nonprofits have this incredible um, vehicle to basically go alongside a person and say, there's something you wanted to do and there's something we wanted to do. There's something that neither of us could have done if we didn't do it together. That's really getting back to the roots. I think what's happened you know, in going back to the technology side over the last 20 years is the pendulum has swung so far um, to essentially automate you know, a lot of the, the friction, um, and there's good friction to remove for sure. Like we don't want to click on five things, you know, we want to click on one in, in the good friction, but we've also removed some opportunities for friction that has gotten in the way of human to human connection. And so I think, you know, the book overall, I, I think is it's, um, someone described it to us as, well, this isn't, um, this is a, a call to less is more. Like we've always, we were like programmed to think more is more. Like we just, I spent 20 years fundraising. We always had to acquire more donors and we'd acquire them at any cost without really thinking about the depth of the connections that we were kind of just, you know, we were, we were extracting money from like ATMs and then forgetting and then move on to the next one. So to me, it's, it is a wake up call. Um, and I think the time, you know, in our country and the division and the social inequality, the time for nonprofits and the opportunity for nonprofits to be, again, that glue that Alexis de Tocqueville talked about, that, you know, is a, is something that all we have to do is imagine a future that's less generous. And I don't think anyone really wants to sign up for that. And to think about the importance of nonprofits and what they, and the role that they play in society. So I don't know if that answered your question directly enough. Good. Maria. Um, the kind of connectedness that Nathan is describing, can that happen online? Have you seen it happen online in your current work? Yes, certainly. And I think that goes along with what I was talking about before, how has human behavior changed? So I think Otis can confirm everyone has always sought community or to be a part of something. Um, and we've always delivered it in different ways within the nonprofit world, you know, through events or coming to the office or you know, these, these true interpersonal ways to feel a part of a uh, community, often it's geography. But what I have seen change is that not everyone uh, wants that type of community. They just want to be surrounded and engaging with people that uh, are passionate about the same thing. And so we've been able to see that. I've been able, I was really surprised when I first came to Good United about the power of communities that are built on Facebook. And that's obviously using Facebook and social media for good, but truly supporting each other and sharing their stories and caring about you know what's actually going on with individuals and putting pictures of their families and it's a true community they may not be there physically together but they the same emotion is evoked and the same support system and they want to continue to stay together so i think that we have to remember that there are a lot of individuals out there that 
don't need geography or face-to-face -to, -face to feel a part of a community. So how can we build um, a community around your mission, around your cause, keep that engaging? And that's a way, if you can get people into that, those are warm leads for your organization. Like you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to buy anything. They're, they're there. So do you have a technology resource or can you build you know, with a partner internally, a way to start connecting with people that are already there. Yeah. Like they feel a part of it. If I could just add something. Yeah. What in one conversation that we had when on the book tour, um, philanthropy together, which, you know, giving circles, it's, it's essentially, it's very encouraging because these giving circles are growing all over the world. Um, one of the comments that came to us was the future of philanthropy is local and local doesn't mean local in your geographic community, but can mean local in, in your digital community as well. And I just really love that sentiment because that it, to me is, it satisfies that need for that, that deeper level of connection. It can happen in lots of different ways. You know, it's a struggle for large multinational nonprofits that have to rethink what it means to appear local, you know, mm -hmm. and, but I think that's actually a really healthy challenge. So um, Jill, I want to go to you because you have a, the river that runs through your career is serving children. And I don't know if anything else will bring a group of people together faster than saying there's a child hungry or a child lost or a child in danger. Um, how does this conversation relate to what you've seen? I think there's a lot of interesting connections. And I, I love the idea of that local thread, whether it's geographically local whether it is online, local, what we saw specifically in the years I spent working on childhood hunger, and of course those years aligned, unfortunately, with the pandemic, is what that meant for children and families in need was they wanted a voice in their community. Hmm. And so I think for so long, when we thought about, not from a nonprofit lens, when we thought about fostering community, it too often meant what we, either as donors or nonprofit leaders or someone not facing that issue, what we wanted to bring to the community. And I think what has truly changed, and if you look at that through the lens of local, or you look at it through the lens of two-way sharing versus two-way communicating, which sometimes are the same things, but purposefully using that word differently here, it's letting these communities, and specifically for us, it was children and families say, what do you actually need in this moment? And let you, as the person in the family we are trying to empower, help inform our strategies, then to be able to go to donors and invite them into the community. Nobody's othered, no one is bested, no one has a voice louder than the other. That was a community changer for us, specifically at the height of the pandemic, to be able to say, Every single person is needed right now, whether you have rage at this moment or you have helplessness at this moment, you have a voice at this table. And I think whether you're working on children's issues or any of the missions that we all now have the pleasure of serving, sharing means something of I'm not going to just tell you this thing and you accept it as I tell you. I'm going to offer something to you. You're going to reshape it and you're going to offer it back to me. And we're going to volley until we get to something that works for everybody. And that for us was a really important game changer when we thought about communities actually that we were working to empower in that moment. I think that's a, that is a lesson I will take forever into in my career that it has to be a two-way sharing and whose voice is actually at that table. So what I'm hearing collectively is that uh, if we solve the crisis of belonging, the feelings that people have that they don't belong strongly enough to something, then we solve this problem of the decline of the small donor. Otis, what is it? Give me like, what is a community? What defines a community? Well, you know, just in, in terms of just kind of the pragmatics of it, uh, there's there's there are four kind of communication in a community. So so let, let's take in a nonprofit uh, scenario. So there's the organization to the individual. There's the individual to the organization, you know, as, as we talked about before. There's communication between individuals in the community. And then there's uh, uh, communication 
between the community members and people that are outside the community. So, you know, maybe think of that as peer to peer fundraising, you know, those, those kinds of things. So all of those channels have to be there in order to have a real community. You know, I, I, I hear all, all the time nonprofits talking about their community. And I know that they just mean the hundred thousand people on their email list. Um, that that's not what a community is. That's a, that's your house list. Okay. That's all that is. And um, if I can just, just go back, I'm not sure I answered your question, Katrina, but I'd like to go back to the one thing that, that, Nathan, that Nathan top uh, dropped a little while ago. You know, he said that there's uh, there's been a, a, a real um, problem with that people feel, don't feel like they can make a difference. And, and I'll tell you, you know, uh, number one, I think that that's something that uh, nonprofits can, can really work on and, and make much better. But number two, boy, if people don't feel like they can make a difference, um, that's a door shutter right there. So, you know, uh, that's kind of the first issue that you have to work on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Maria? No, I was I know that a lot of people are like, okay, what's the answers now? So. <laughs> okay, before we transition to answers, we have, I think, three really good questions, and uh, let's put them here, and then we're going to move to, like, here's what we're going to do, people, and we're going to give you unlimited budget and unlimited manpower yes. to do it, and yes. a support system in terms of leadership that is so on your team already said yes. Okay, but before that, um, from Amanda Baldwin, what are some ways that organizations can highlight ideal actions by people like us for Otis? What are some ways organizations can highlight ideal actions that would demonstrate people like us do things like this? Well, you know, I, I is, that, is that to me, Katrina? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, um, I think that 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 is in the uh, uh, th those are in the the kinds of uh, uh, newsletters and so forth that you're sending out out, out to your community. Um, you know, getting getting not the organization to talk about about the benefits that they have um, from uh, from doing certain things. Uh, you know, I, I talked to the to, to the VCU Foundation la last week, and I and I said, you know, you should be creating a social norm for being these bequeathed to you to your wills, and you know, it shouldn't be the Gottwald family in Richmond doing a three million dollar bequest. It sh it should be a retired dentist um, who you know someone just like me. So having that person talk about why they made a bequest to the VCU Foundation, you know, those are the kind of people that you want to really talk about how good it makes them feel. And it does make them feel good, these 66-year-olds. I know, because I am one. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that you can do with that to give voice to other people in your community rather than the organization always doing the talking. Yeah, very good. All right, Nathan, to you. Um, we talked about the declines in the small donor. The question is, are these being seen across the country in socio-political lines, or are there outliers? Would also love to see the breakdown here of religious affiliation versus secular organizations. That's a pretty detailed question. I don't know what you have on that. Yeah, the first part is hard. I mean, I would reference a book uh, by Arthur Brooks called Who Really Cares, where um, essentially our book, and Arthur it actually endorsed our book. It was essentially a 20-year follow-up from when he wrote that, when he was really challenged by this notion of whether or not you know Democrats or Republicans are more generous, which one, and and he really did this in really good study to basically show that there's really not a big difference between political party, um, but between um, obviously from classes from the um, the the wealth the disparity of wealth absolutely right we see um, you know really big differences um, from minorities. Um, it, that are just not giving nearly at the same levels. And it's also probably because they're not asked and they're, you know, essentially forgotten since most nonprofits are using wealth data to prioritize their lists. They're essentially going back to rich white men. And that's been something that has really kind of plagued our industry for the past 40 years. I would say, you know, the, the religious part was probably one of my more favorite um, studies of uh, I grew up in a religious household, so I under I I and we I grew up poor, and you know we were in the line at the food bank as kids, uh, but we also understood our responsibility and virtues of giving back. So I I grew up volunteering for Habitat for Humanity and and always learning how to pay it forward. I think um, you know in the studies that Giving USA does now they do these episodic studies that show that no matter what religion you participate in, you're twice as likely to give and you give twice as much. 
it's mm -hmm. not the religion. It's about really understanding at a younger age that, you know, there's a responsibility and benefits, you know, to giving and being part of a society. What's been interesting in Giving USA and, and um, uh, Olivia can look up the Giving USA, the latest summary data on their website, but, you know, re religious giving 50 years ago was like 80 to 90 percent of the country, um, you know, gave to participated in and gave to now religious affiliations, but it didn't been declining at six percent per year every year. So so that's affecting obviously gifts to uh, religious entities, but it's affecting gifts to all entities because essentially um, younger children who a lot of times learn about philanthropy from their moms aren't really being taught those. And it's frankly a chapter in our book we always wanted to write. Like, what is a replacement for that? Because, mm -hmm. it, you know, it was depressing enough to call a book the generosity crisis and then let alone just everybody tell everybody, go back to church. It's not a practical, you know, um, statement in today's day. And so what we really struggled with is like, what is that replacement? And we're still looking for it. I mean, to be honest, um, it's whether or not we change the definition of philanthropy to include just generosity um and, and not needing to go through a nonprofit or um or what are the other ways that we're going to instill the virtues of giving at a very young age there's groups like 4-h that do that really really well um right. but not enough of that in my opinion so i would look at giving usa for that breakdown um religious giving which what dominated the report for pretty much ever um is now you know i mean it's a, a much smaller portion and continuing to decline pretty rapidly Got it. All right. So now we're going to move to the, you've got all the budget, you've got all the manpower, your leadership, you know, is your mom. So she'll do whatever you want because she thinks you're brilliant. Right. Um, and this will hopefully for the audience, give you direction. We know that you don't have this situation in house with you, but I'm going to start with Jill. Jill, you can do anything you want. How do you solve this? I love it. But the no barriers of what we can do here. No barriers. Um, I, I think it's equal investment in resource allocation mm -hmm. internally. I think to Nathan's point, and I think we've all made this point, we either invest in things that we think have a low ROI, or we invest in things that'll give us a high charity watchdog rating. And if we really had no walls, we would say, who are the audiences that are critical to the community that I need to create? Not who are the audiences that are in my house file, Otis. Who are the ones that I'm looking to create? Where are they? And I need equal investment of resource allocation until I prove that it's not working. Create some nimbleness in there. Create some optimization within that. But I want to be able to say I'm putting equal resource allocation without the barriers of ROI, and without the barriers of charity watchdog groups that are going to say, how much are you spending on X or Y? And then the last thing I'll say is impact focus metrics, impact focus metrics, impact focus metrics. We talk a lot about big numbers. I want to reach a million people in this population, but for what? Can we start ending those big metric sentences with what impact we're trying to achieve in a way that our organization is willing to put a stake in the ground on? So mm -hmm. kind of two swings, but I think they're equally important. Love it. Okay. So I'm the CEO and I'm your mom and I love you, but I need to know how long this is going to take. Like, are we going to be in college 10 years or five years? That's what I need. To <laughs> mm, that's a great question. I, probably five, let's say five. I think if we're yeah. truly going to think about changing strategies, there is a, a huge amount of pressure on nonprofits and fundraisers right now. And we know what's been working is not going to get us to where we've been before. And for those of us who have been doing for this for a long time, you can probably point to the moments in your career where that's been true and you had to convince somebody it was true. I'm not sure we have to convince a lot of people right now that what's what we've been doing isn't working. So yeah. I think with the right strategies, the right investment, the right changes of hearts and minds on leaderships and boards, college for five years. So what you're telling me, dearest Jill, is that I need to invest in non-revenue producing activities yes. for a while. That's right. Okay. And I All think right. that goes to the good question in the chat about metrics that we can get to in a minute too. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Maria, I'm going to go to you next. And part of it's because I know, I think some of this is connected to your past. I think you and I were part of a series of decisions that said, you know, these events just don't show ROI. We're going to cut them all. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. okay. Forget about that tra trauma. You've got everything, everything you want. What do yeah. you do? 
Well, and I think if if your charge is to change and improve individual giving, you have to ask yourselves, what are we going to do differently to attract a new segment or a different segment? You can't just keep going back to the same well, the same donor file over and over again. So what are you going to do differently? And that's, you know, really hard sometimes to get your hands around. And if you're going to rely on traditional methods, what are you going to do differently to make them more effective? Because we can't, you know, the definition of insanity, you can't keep doing the same thing, going back to the same people and expect different results. So I think that's an important question to ask. And I would recommend to go where the people are. Uh, we're seeing with our partners that we continue to see like 80, 90, 90% or higher net new to donor file social media fundraisers. So there's a whole universe out there. It's not saturated. There's a whole universe out there. How are you effectively reaching out to them? And do you, can you embrace, I love what you're saying, Jill. Can you embrace new technology or new strategies to reach a different segment? You can't think you're going to reach a different segment with, you know, old strategies that worked in a different channel. So what, what are you embracing? And I think that's where you really start rethinking your engagement tactics. We have a uh, great partner who just finished up a challenge on Facebook and they realized that they had accumulated well over 3000 leads. These are warm leads, people that raise their hand, joined a group, started a fundraiser, shared their story. These are warm individuals. And he started rethinking his original plan where he was going to go buy a donor list. He's like, why do I need to buy a donor list? Our people are right here in this community. How can we activate this community as opposed to going back to something that's been advised for years, go buy a donor list. So really rethinking your strategies. And I think it's just, again, looking at if, if there's a new world, new human behaviors are trying to reach, what are you going to, again, do differently? How are you going? You're already... And it shouldn't be one or the other. I like what Jill's saying, equal investment. It doesn't mean if you try this, you need to dump all the old. No, let's bring new technology or new tactics into existing ones to amplify them. I mean, a good example is you're already posting, every, every org has been engaged on Facebook at least since 18 when the money started pouring in. You know, posting stories, uh, trying to build community, using ad spend. Now there are technologies, there's availability to use that, those same strategies, but drive revenue from it and uh, start a communication and engagement with those individuals. So how can you take what you're already doing, you know, bring something, a new investment into it to amplify that and then take like those leads that the other organization attracted. How can you use those leads? You don't have to keep them only in your social media. Maybe you use those leads to invite them to an in-person event, or maybe you use those to develop a pipeline, you know, for, for your major gift campaign. So really looking at how you can uh, use new strategies, new technology, new investment to start something new, maybe that you're not doing already, and then amplify what you're doing before. It takes collaboration and you're going to have to work across departments. Right. So let me ask a question about that. So um, in my uh, travels, mm -hmm. I've seen great success, for example, in the social media channel, both raising money, raising awareness, creating community, and then it stops. And yeah. in, in our perfect world where my mom is the CEO, that never happens. But in the real world, I see a lot of battling between departments so that the, the perfect list, which I think you just described, and we believe that too, peer-to-peer -peer social fundraising should be about you know, acquisition, creating the perfect list that's been vetted by a human being with personal decision-making, that okay. person has capacity and affinity. I'm going to ask them, what, what's happening? Why does the data stay, for example, with a social media person instead of flowing into right. other channels? What's happening? And if you could be real quick, because I want to get to Otis and Nathan. Yeah. A lot of issues. I think just the, the leadership forcing mm -hmm. collaboration or building mm -hmm. collaboration. Uh, how is your CRN system? Understanding the data, how it's coming in and uh, giving other people access to it so you can analyze it together. If you want to make big change, like Jill's talking about, big, you know, it can't be uh, siloed in one department. It really has to, like, if you can 
drive new net revenue through social media, that's fantastic. But what else can you get out of that? You've got hundreds of thousands of engaged constituents. How are you talking to them? And what do you talk to them about? You shouldn't only talk about your next social media campaign. You should talk about your Giving Tuesday or your annual event series yeah, or your yeah. awareness month. And that's going to take a true collaboration across departments and um, just sharing that data. data. Data analytics are so critical. Nathan can speak to that, but there's so much rich data you can now connect, collect from social media. How are you using it as an organization? Okay. Not Very just good. to be your social media strategy. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to go to Otis and then Nathan, I'm going to let you bring us home. Otis, okay. you've got all the money, all the humans, all the agreement. They love you. They'll do anything you say. What do you do? Uh, you know, this is what I'd say. I would, I would uh, have the CEO say, Hey, you know what? High lifetime value is all that we care about here. And everything else pivots around that. Your social media campaigns pivot around that. Your major giving, your major gifts pivots around that. By the way, you know, you 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 think that major gifts is uh, uh, kind of uh, going out and panning for gold, and it's uh, you know kind of a uh, the easiest, most efficient way. You know, the people that give major gifts have been almost always been your small donor donors anyway. So um, you know, it's it, it's really figuring out who's in charge of your community. You know, you asked the question earlier. You know, why, why do communities stall out? Well, you know, is it because it's in the development group? Is it in the, is is it uh, hosted by the marketing people? Is it, you know, it could be any group. And as long as you have these barriers between the groups and they have their own metrics, it's not everybody going for high lifetime value. You're, you know, wh whoever's in charge of it just can't carry the day and make the thing sustain. So high lifetime value, equal community, equal belonging, equal fixing this. Nathan, yes. what would you do? Unlimited resources, all agreement. Yeah, I well, I, I agree with Otis so much. I would start there. I probably, you know, for me, I think if I had that magic wand um, to go into an organization and make systemic change, it would be number one, um, when a board is looking at a report, I would say it, whether you call it retention or lifetime value, the two are very closely connected, um, that would be above revenue. So like literally the first thing you look at are, you know, how are we doing with our relationships? Second to that, it would be revenue. And I did this when I was at City of Hope, but we moved to a three-year rolling average. And I will tell you that changed everything for our organization. It changed uh, fundraiser, bad behaviors. It changed, uh, it, it gave everyone kind of the ability to work in donors timeline versus our timeline. Moving, it, it's also surprising because whenever I I I speak at a conference in person, I always ask the group, like how many of you are on a three-year rolling average? It's like 3% of nonprofits actually operate on a three-year rolling average. So first, top line KPI is relationships, LTV or, or retention. Second, move to three-year rolling average. And third, I think it's just something that is so critical and I'm biased on this, obviously, because I work in AI, is to create a philanthropic R&D budget. I mean, it's like less than 1% of organizations have that. And we're we're competing, you know, with the most sophisticated, you know, for attention and connection. Like we're, we're competing as organizations with really advanced technology. And it's like, we're using a pencil and they're using a supercomputer. And so- um, I think that's just something that nonprofits are really going to have to evaluate is how do we invest in the future and that, you know, innovation and R&D actually means risk and it means things failing, but like picking yourself up and iterating and trying again. I mean, gosh, if I was starting a nonprofit today and I, and I created it kind of with that kind of core, you know, mantra or philosophy, I think it'd have such a good chance of success. And I, you know, through my volunteer work, I, those are the type of principles I bring, but um, I think it, it's just something that we need to rethink how, you know, the measure of success is for nonprofits um, now realizing that the world that we compete in is vastly different. So let me ask you, Nathan, a couple more minutes. Uh, if you had to say what cost us more, Lack of a sense of belonging or friction and defining friction as both poor segmentation, poor personalization, and actual user interface friction. What cost us more? So <laughs> that's a really tough question because and I think they're both connected, right? I mean, because if we if we remove 
friction in a good way. Um, we were actually the time, you know, time is essentially the, the essence of what nonprofits need, right? They need time to build trust and they can, if they offload and they reduce friction by using technology, then they can spend more time building trust. So, and building that community. So I don't know, I think they're both related in my opinion. I, I don't think they're um, bifurcated from that sense. I, I, I guess I'd be greedy and say you need, you need both. Okay. All right. Jake Nathan, thank you for writing the book. It was fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Otis, I'll see you for dinner. And <laughs> Jill, so good to see you. Thank you for lending your expertise and your experience. Change starts with just one person, you. If today's episode got your gears turning, don't forget to share it with your network. And hey, why not drop us a review? Your review helps more people find us and spread the good. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Until next time, this is Katrina signing off from Seeding Social Good Podcast by Turnkey. Stay inspired, keep making waves, and let's create a better world together.